Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I will give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to David Richmond. He is an author. His most recent book is called Cycle of Lives. It explores emotional journeys of people with cancer and surrounding cancer stories. And he interviewed these people while doing a 5,000 mile solo bike tour across the States. And he's got a lot of other fun, interesting things going on about him. So I'm excited to get to know him and hear more about his story. So David, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit more about yourself? Oh, thanks, Sarah. Um, Actually, the bike ride happened after I started uh, talking to everyone. So what I did was I, I found all these people and talked to them for maybe a couple of years on the phone. But um, in order to connect the stories, I, I thought it would be cool to get on my bike and go meet them all for the first time. So the bike ride was actually to go see them all for the first, or as many as I could get to um, for the first time after having talked to them for a couple of years. So it was, it was pretty nuts. But um, yeah, that book was born out of a, um, uh, an experience that I had with my sister. And I mean, really that's where the start of it was. And if I could set the stage a little bit for you and for your listeners. Um, so I was in my late thirties, kind of like at a low point in my life, really stressed out at work. I had a very unhealthy, I was in a very unhealthy relationship and I needed to get me and my kids away and to safety out of that relationship. Um, I was overweight. I was a smoker. I was like just miserable kind of person. And I really wasn't in touch with anything about who I was or who I wanted to be or any of that. And at that same time, um, my sister called me up and said, Hey, I I gotta let you know, I've got brain cancer and it's probably terminal. And so I found myself kind of at this weird place where, um, I finally decided to live my life in a purposeful way, you know, like start to worry about making myself happy and doing the things that will fulfill my needs rather than looking for external uh, validation or trying to fix other people's problems or, you know, saying, Hey, you dug yourself a hole now get out of it, you know, because that's what you're supposed to do or what all these things that were putting the focus on everybody, but me. So I'm starting this journey of like trying to figure life out. And my sister starting this journey of, you know, getting to the end of her life way too soon. And so that created a really interesting dynamic for her and I to kind of discuss all the emotional aspects of what was going on. But I noticed um, that that was an unusual occurrence, that people felt comfortable um, and purposefully engaged in hard conversations around like traumatic stuff like death and dying and disease and that kind of stuff. Um, usually about the emotional side of it, we're pretty silent. We self-isolate and we keep others at a distance for a number of different reasons. And I noticed that with survivors, loved ones, doctors, patients, you name it, uh, like they could deal with the tasks around their trauma, but they couldn't deal with the emotions on it. And I said, well, geez, let me you know, I'm a storyteller. Let me, let me find really interesting stories and, um, uh, try to tell them in a way that would evoke some emotion in the reader and maybe some identification so that we, as people could take what we could learn from these stories to have more heart centered, grounded, authentic, on purpose discussions with the people that are in our lives. So that's an overview of what the project was all about. Yeah. And thanks for the clarification, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, And I actually, I think it's kind of great that that is how like the bike ride happened, that you were talking to people and then it was like, I'm doing this and going to, you know, continue the conversations. So how was it doing this bike ride? And, you know, I I know a little bit more that you've become very athletic. Uh, can, (laughs) Can you talk a little bit about that, that 180? Sure. So, um, you know, there's a lot to unpack in that because, um, I feel like people 
kind of you like in a pinball game you kind of bounce around off of things based on circumstance or opportunity or you know whatever and you know i kind of felt like in fact as a kid i kind of loved pinball but i kind of felt like i kind of felt like i was the ball being you know just bounced around and hit by the flippers or whatever you know like i didn't i didn't take it take my my journey on purpose i just kind of bounced around from thing to thing and when i decided that um, I really wanted to take charge and, and be myself and, you know, forgive myself for mistakes I had made and, you know, like start finding out the answers to the question of who am I, um, that allowed me the opportunity to pursue other things. Like I would say, I could never have pictured myself as a athlete or a runner. So how do you then picture yourself as a runner? You start to run. Well, you can't smoke and run. Right. And you know, I thought, well, if, okay, if I can run, why don't I like swim, bike and run so I can do triathlons. And if I can do a triathlon, why don't I try an Ironman? And if I can do an Ironman, why don't I run 50 miles? And if I can run 50 miles, why don't I, you know, go for a 300 mile bike ride? And if I could do that, why don't I just bike across the country? So it's, it's been like this journey to say, you know, like if you set your goals really, really high and you want to be something on purpose, like you really are working to be that for you, then just do it. Like just figure out a way to do it. And so that's how I started. Um, I've done like 18 Ironmans and a million other endurance athletic events and stuff. So I've gone from, you know, never seeing myself as an athlete, not, I don't even necessarily see myself as an athlete, but I see myself as athletic. Like I do a lot of, a lot of endurance events. And so I, you know, it's, it's like, it's never too late to start to become who you want to become. Do you know, it's never too late to start the things you want to do. You know, gosh, I mean, how many times you hear of somebody who's this phenomenal artist and they didn't start art until they were 60 years old or something, right? You can become whatever you want to be. Um, if you, if you give yourself the freedom to focus on yourself. So that's kind of what I did as I said, oh, okay, go ahead, focus on yourself for once instead of everybody else. And did you struggle to make that lifestyle change to quit smoking and start running? Yeah, it's definitely a struggle. Um, you know, it's really easy if you have, I mean, everybody has bad habits, right? And everybody has destructive things that they do, you know, you you know, or even as simple as avoiding, like if some people are procrastinators or they have avoidance technique or they say, ah, one day I'll get to it or something, or they come up with a million reasons. Oh, I'm too tired to do this or, oh, I can never do that or whatever. I'll wait until a certain time, but you just got to just start, you, you know, you just got to start. And, uh, yeah, it was tough because I use cigarettes as a crutch for a lot of things. I would avoid stressful situations by going to have a cigarette. Right. I would, I would, uh, I would, uh, uh, give myself a quote unquote mental break by going outside to have a cigarette. Uh, right. That, that, that was just a avoidance. I was avoiding dealing with things. So when, when I started uh, living in reality, which is, you know, like doing things on purpose, you, you, nobody's going to, nobody's going to do harmful things to themselves on purpose. Really. I mean, really, if you know, if you have a keen sense of awareness of what you're doing to yourself, people, people aren't going to do bad things to themselves for the most part. And so um, it was hard. It's definitely hard to change bad habits or to change, you know, if you're a procrastinator or if you're, you know, avoiding or if you're used to, you know, zoning out and watching Netflix or you're used to playing on your phone or you're, you're used to whatever, it's hard to change those things, man. It's really hard, right? Yeah. Yeah, it definitely is. You are uh, currently preaching to the choir and how my last couple of months have been. Uh, and I'm looking forward to my two week break from work and the holidays. <laughs> so you can go do all these other things that you need to and want to do, right? Exactly. Yes. And yeah. I'm hoping that it'll be able to kind of re kickstart the what I was doing and, and those sort of routines that that I enjoyed. So what was it like when you started talking and having these conversations for the book? Like, how did you go about finding people to talk to and gathering stories? Well, sure. So what I wanted to do um, was I feel like humans are only connected by two things. We're, we're connected by story and we're connected by emotion, right? I mean, there's not anybody out there listening that 
if somebody that you um, admire, like, want to be around says, hey, let me tell you a story, you're always going to lean in. And, you know, even though we have different emotional reactions to things and we process our emotions differently, we, we, we all have the same basic emotions. So I just played on that theory of if we're all connected by story and we're connected by emotions, then let me tell us, tell stories that will uh, interest the reader, that will evoke emotion, that will inspire them to engage in really hard conversations. And the only way that I could do that in my mind was not tell like one really crazy, amazing story because you might not identify with it. I wanted to find people that had a wide range of age. I wanted to hear from somebody who had cancer uh, five different times in their adult life over a 35 year period. And also somebody who was just fearful of cancer because both could be just as traumatic. I wanted uh, people who had different ranges of cancer, different severities of cancer um, uh, that were coming from it from different aspects. They were a nurse or a patient or a loved one or a survivor or lost a loved one. Um, and uh, lastly, I wanted people that had a range of different emotions that they brought to their cancer journey from whatever perspective it was. And those emotions were normally, uh, are usually uh, affected by the traumas in their life. And so how were they, when they encountered cancer, let's say at point A, how were they able to, or how were they not able to navigate the emotional side of point B, the journey from A to B, B being today, in relation to all these previous traumas that they had. And so I felt like I might not be able to understand what it's like for somebody to, um, you know, for somebody to go through losing a spouse, but I probably could understand what it's like to suffer some type of loss and then um, be inspired to get past that and learn how to love again. You know, I might not understand like how you couldn't ask for help if you really needed it, like going through cancer, like why would you do everything on your own? I can't kind of identify with that or learn something from it. But if I know that the person that never wanted help was because they've been abandoned their whole life and not, and I can understand how afraid they are to ask for help, then that makes me understand it a little bit more. So long answer to, to your question, but I, what I wanted to do was to get these wide range of people that we could identify with who they were pre point A is when they encountered the cancer uh, from whatever perspective. And then point B, how they were, were not able to navigate the emotional side and then tell the stories in a way where we could identify and thus learn something from them. And do you talk about your own story with the situation with your sister? <laughs> yeah, it's funny because let me, let me tell you a quick story. So, um, when I wrote the 15 stories, I sent it to my editor and, and it's funny because every one of the 15 stories, every time I talked to somebody, they were like, yeah, my story's not that interesting. And, you know, I'm just living my life. I'm just dealing with what I need to deal. But OK, if you think it's interesting, we'll talk about it. So I write the 15 stories and I send it off to my editor and she goes, uh, yeah, there's one problem here, David. And she goes, you put yourself in their stories. Right. Their stories are not about you. You have nothing to do with their lives. You need to extricate yourself from their stories and just make their stories about them. She goes, and then I think you should write a narrative of your story in between their stories. And I go, ah, my story is not that interesting. Nobody cares about that or whatever. Right. <laughs> so funny. And she goes, yeah, I know. That's exactly what you say about all your book participants. But she goes, it is kind of interesting. And so I do. I in, in between each of the 15 stories. I give um, a tiny little bit of a transition story about what's going on in the bike ride, the people that I meet, the emotions that I still had to process over losing my sister um, and some other, some other things that I thought would be uh, relevant to my, my story and my journey having gone through this cycle all lives project myself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. And I, I mean, your editor gave you great advice. That was what an editor is for. <laughs> <laughs> right. So then what was the like actual bike ride like? Brutal. <laughs> in a word, brutal. I mean, I did 5,000 miles in 45 days. 
So if you could imagine doing the math, that's like 120 miles a day. I took four days off along the way, but, um, you know, I did like 120 miles a day on a heavy bike solo. I mean, I had support along the way, but I was, you know, doing this, the bike solo and I was uh, completely unsupported for maybe about a third of the days or so. So uh, it was really hard. I was like eight, 10, 12, more, more like 12 to 14 hours a day. My shortest day was about seven hours. My longest was 17 and I did it day after day after day. Um, really, really difficult, very brutal physically, um, emotionally, it was really taxing because I was dealing with heavy stuff. Um, and, you know, writing these stories in my head and dealing with the people that I met along the way who were, you know, connecting with me and talking to me about their stories, um, visiting cancer centers, that type of stuff. And then, um, you know, it was also psychologically very difficult because I, I was, under pressure to get from point A to point B every day. I had to, I had to get, cause the hotels were donated and they were all donated, you know, on a specific night. So I kind of had to get where I needed to get to every day, which was really tough. And, and the bike ride was done mostly on interstates. So, cause you know, I had to get to the fastest point, you know, from city to city or from, from place to place. So that's normally on the interstate. So I was that guy that's riding the bike on the interstate and people are flying by going, what the hell is that guy doing on the interstate, man? That's not safe. I did that for like 4,000 of the 4,700 miles. And would you do it again? Not the same way I did it. No, I would love to do it again. It, it's really, um, it, it's very calming, meditative, uh, very transformative to do, to immerse yourself into hard physical activity where it's, it's, um, that is the focus. So, um, you know, when you're biking for 12 hours straight and that's all you're going to do that day, it, it, it's a really wonderful place for contemplation. Um, and for just being one with your surroundings and, you know, kind of, especially if you happen to be off the highway and you're more in nature, it's a way to kind of connect with nature. And so I would do it again, but I wouldn't do it the way I did, I did it way too fast, way, way too purposefully, way, way too hectically. I, I would, I would much rather do it on a slower, you know, less aggressive way because I probably wouldn't be so stressed out or I, and I was beat. It took me like a year, Sarah, to recoup. I was really, really tired. And, and that's definitely understandable. Now, did you have good weather for the entire ride? Uh, if, the devil were to be congratulated, then yes, I had good weather because it was hot as hell every day. I started September 1st and the year I did it, there was heat waves going all across the Western United States. The first 12 days, the the high was never below 100 degrees. Ooh. So most of the times I was out there in 100, 100 plus degree weather. The wind was completely, insanely brutal in your face every day, no matter which direction you're going through. And I was getting, you know, two, three, four, five, even six or seven flat tires in a day because I'm on the interstate and the little tiny little metal pieces from shredded uh, radial tires, you know, steel belted radial tires, uh, you can't even see them. Like they're tiny little specks, but they pop through your tire and, and puncture your tubes pretty regularly. So it was... No, no, it was not. It was not. That part of it was not fun. And I, and I would say uh, that if I were going to congratulate anybody, I would congratulate the devil for making it really tough on me. <laughs> uh, that's great. Now, were you able to enjoy parts of the U.S. while you were doing this trip? No, um, I really wasn't because I didn't I didn't take any time to meander. Mm -hmm. Right. Um uh, every once in a while, I'd be like close to like a beautiful college campus or something and alter my route for a, a, a you know, mile or two so I could go ride my bike across the campus or something. But every once in a while, I would see something where I, oh, that's kind of cool. I'll stop and take a look for a minute. But no, really, I was, I was biking, you know, like I said, I get up at seven in the morning, I put on my bike clothes, I'd have breakfast, I go biking for a few hours have lunch, biking for more hours, you know, have a snack and then figure out a way to 
you know, bike, I put on my night gear and bike, bike at night. I get home, I get to a hotel at nine, 10, 11 o'clock at night. I literally would check into the hotel, take my clothes off, stomp them in the shower to clean them and pass out asleep after one more meal, probably. And then I wake up and put my clothes back on and do the same thing every day. I didn't have much time to stop. Yeah. And that's, you know, you were on a mission. I was on a mission. I was 10 days in, in, uh, in Texas. And I, I think I did eight or nine days in Florida just because of the, the sheer distance of those States. And I got to see like some cool stuff, you know, like when you're biking along the back roads of Texas, it's, it's kind of cool. And along the panhandle of Florida was, was really pretty. So I got to see some cool things, but it, it was constant, constant movement. And have you had the chance to, at other times, be able to explore these different parts of the country? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, who doesn't love to travel, right? I mean, I love to travel. I've, I've been to a lot of places. I, I I love being out there in nature and learning stuff and and seeing it. But it's it's crazy how, um, how sh- uh, sh- narrow my view of the 4,700 miles was. It was mostly pavement. <laughs> right not a whole lot every once in a while it wasn't but you know mo- most days was was pavement that's what i was looking at right that's yeah you know because if i if i didn't look at the pavement sarah i could either uh, go off to the right and be off the freeway into uh, into some river or into a swamp or you know uh, off a bridge and if i went left just a, a couple of feet i'd be into traffic and maybe getting run over so i mean whew, I was focused, focused. Yeah, yeah, you gotta be. Yeah. Did you ever have people like stop you and be like, sir, (laughs) what are you doing? Yeah, I did. Oh my God, this one guy in Texas. So um, people get angry at bikers. I don't know why they get so angry at people on bikes, but but they get angry and they honk their horn and they whatever. And I was like, by the time I got to Texas, I was a little raw from all the honking of horns and you know, people coming close to swiping you and uh, just all this stuff. And I'm in Dallas, which the freeway system in Dallas is not bike friendly, right? No freeway is supposed to be bike friendly, but it's particularly not bike friendly in Dallas because you could all of a sudden be on a lane and then it, it ends and you got to hop over a lane to get to the shoulder. It just doesn't make sense. And I see this car stop in front of me and I'm like, oh my God, uh oh, this is going to be terrible. And I start to slow down and this dude gets out and he's this big monster of a guy and he's got this serious look on his face and he starts walking back to me and I'm like, oh no. So I stop like 10 feet in front of him. I go, yeah. And he said, he gets this big grin on his face and he goes, dude, he goes, I'm a cyclist and I'm driving back from a ride and I see this guy with bags on his bike and looking all tattered like you do. There's got to be a story there, man. What are you doing? And so... That guy actually became a friend. He's 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 a friend now, and it's it's pretty funny. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I did get to talk to a lot of fun people along the way, and um, you know, uh, oftentimes when I was on the side of the road changing a tire, people would stop and say, "Hey, you know, do you need any help?" Um, you know, it was pretty cool. I I met really amazing people uh, every day, all day, and and um, that that was the that was the big surprise uh, that. Every single person I talked to that I had the opportunity to tell them what I was doing or to answer the question about that they asked about what I was doing, um, every single person, bar none, every single one said, oh, my God, you know, my friend at work just got cancer. I don't know what to say to him. Or, you know, when my grandfather was dying with cancer and he just died a couple of weeks ago, gosh, I was, you know, really, I didn't want to, I didn't want to uh, bother him. I felt so guilty about asking him how he feels and you know, uh, and every single person had a story about somebody that was going through something traumatic like cancer and how they weren't equipped to have the hard conversation. And it was cool in one sense, because it made me, you know, it was provided me some, some definite support and validation that the project really was important. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about what it was like then to publish this book? Yeah. Well, publishing books is tough, right? There's not, I mean, it really is uh, for anybody out there that's, that's written books and uh, authored any books. I mean, really it, it's, it's really weird because there's millions of books out there. There's thousands and thousands of books coming out every day and 
people write for different reasons. You know, you write because you have something to say. You write because you want to make it, you know, seem like you're an expert. You want it to be a calling card. I mean, there's a million reasons that people write. They have a story and they want to get it out there. I mean, there's a million things, right? Um, and um, it's not my first book. I've, I've written others. And I really wanted in this one the 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 right publisher. And uh, in the book of in the world of publishing, you either are going to self publish uh, because nobody will publish you because you don't have a platform, and maybe it's unknown whether you're going to sell any books or why they're going to why they're going to invest in you when they can't invest in somebody else, you know, or you're a really big name, and that's where they put all their money in, right? You know, you get you get the Obamas that get seventy five million in in, in, you know, advanced fees or, you know, Oprah Winfrey will write a book and, you know, they'll pay her 10 million bucks ahead of time. Cause they know they're going to sell millions and millions of books, which, which is understandable. It's a business. Um, I want it. I, I ended up going in between something called a hybrid publisher. So I have my own editor. Um, uh, she was amazing and I've worked with her on several projects. So, um, we kind of get each other and then I went with a hybrid publisher. So it's, it's, it's both traditionally published in certain ways and kind of self-promotion and self-marketing in other ways. Um, but one of the things that my wife and I uh, committed to when we embarked on this project was that it's going to be a charitable endeavor. So all of the uh, proceeds from the book are going to support the cancer focused charities and hospitals and other organizations that the participants in the book chose. So um, even though there's not a lot of money in books, um, whatever money there is, it's, it's all going to support these organizations. And that's such an important piece to it, I think. Um, and to have the participants even to be the ones to choose where the money is, is going. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have any future projects that you're currently working on? Well, I, I do, <laughs> you know, I say, um, uh, at some point, I'll have the ability to be writing full time. Um, it, it's really hard. It's really hard to do because, like I said, there's not a lot of money in it. And besides that, you got to balance, um, you know, promoting and and marketing and building your platform and doing all this other stuff that's not writing. Um, you know, so and then I'm kind of this classic um, writer where. Yeah, there's this old saying, if you want to know whose house on the block is owned by a writer, it'll be the cleanest one because what they want to do everything but write, you know? <laughs> so, so it's easy for me to avoid writing because I have so many other things I have to do or I'm choosing to do. So I, I do have many, many books I've been working on, many, many projects I've been um, wanting to work on or have worked on. I've got, you know, ton of different things I want to write and that I have written. It's just a matter of when I'll be able to focus fully on that part of my life. So, um, but it's, it's really, it's really good. And, and, you know, my, so everybody has a reason for writing as, as we talked about just a minute ago. Uh, my, my reason is I, I really like telling stories and, and I really like to know that my stories can have an impact on people or evoke some emotional response from them that, uh, positive or negative, you know, kind of has a meaningful impression on them, even if for just the short term. So I know that my books have done that from the feedback I've gotten. So it's kind of fueling me to say, yeah, let's, let's keep it going, you know? And so then how did you get into writing the first time? Like, do you have a background in storytelling? Um, I, I think that I do. I, I, you know, ever since I was a kid, I, I felt like I was pretty observant. Uh, maybe not self-observant, right? As we talked about before, like, you know, I didn't really know who I was, but I was really good on, on, on figuring out other people and what, whatever I've done, um, I, I use storytelling as a way to make my point or a way to make a point or a way to, you know, kind of connect with people. So I feel like storytelling is something I've, I've always done. And, um, uh, so I didn't write my first book to publish until about 10 or 11 years ago. And so it, you know, that's late, that's later in life. Right. So 
you know, I, I learned there's a big difference between being a, a writer and being an author, right? Uh, everybody can write, but until you actually put something out there and get it published, whether you do it yourself or through a publisher, you know, it's a, that's a whole that's a whole different thing. It's like when if you like to do art, right? Well, there's a big difference between painting a bunch of things and being really good at it and loving it. And then a whole nother thing to then partner with a gallery and have a showing and sell your pieces. Those are very different things. So I'm kind of like the, I'm in the bridge between those two areas. Mm -hmm. Now, would you say that you have found yourself and now know who you are? <laughs> See, why don't you ask me a really tough question? Because that one sure is easy. No. Um, no, I say yes in some ways and yes in uh, no in other ways. Um, I really have this deep belief, Sarah, that, um, and I'm, I'm really interested in, le in learning. So I have this deep belief that if I know everything about something, then I'm fooling myself. And um, you, you don't, you can't really know. You can't, I feel like you can't be at a place of peace or you can't, you can't know anything. And if you do, you might as well just pack it up and, and stay home and, and live out your life, you know, having, you know, no interaction with anybody else. Cause I feel like every conversation I go to, I can learn something. Every event I go to, I can, I can learn something. Every project I take on, I, I, I hope to figure out what's going to happen. Right. So I'm doing that with my own self as well, where I don't want to know everything about me or think I figured it all out. Because if I have, I mean, then what, what's the point of waking up every day? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Now, would you be willing to talk a little bit about your family? You mentioned that you were in a rough relationship. Mm -hmm. um, you obviously don't have to talk about it. I got no problem talking about anything. I mean, you know, the, the, here, here's the, here's the problem with, with interaction and discussions is, is it, is that, um, oftentimes we come to the discussion already knowing what our positions are and we just try to, um, you know, make our point or, uh, convince somebody of, you know, the way something is, I, I feel like the only way that I learn is when I know somebody's being authentic and they're listening as well as asking um, or telling. Right. And, and so to have like true, you know, I think it's called uh, generative uh, dialogue is, is really, is really important. And that just means you just, you, you just don't, you got to intentionally ask questions and you really don't know the answer. And so I'll answer anything, you know, for sure. So I, I guess with my family, that everybody has a rough childhood or a rough adolescence. Nobody has it easy. And if they do, I don't know. I, I, I just don't think they do. So I, mine isn't any worse than anybody else's or any better. It's just, I had a weird growing up. I had a mom who was really young and didn't really like the fact that she had kids. And I had a dad that was really old. And probably didn't at that point in his life really want to deal with kids. There was almost a 40 year age difference between the two of them. So uh, my mom was 18. My dad was 56 when they got married. So uh, my sister and I grew up in a, in a world where, you know, my mom was always angry and my dad was kind of mentally checked out a little bit. And so um, we just relied on each other. And so, I think I grew grew up, Sarah, um, trying to fix, metaphorically fix that relationship with my mom, you know, mm -hmm. try to make somebody love me that didn't want to love me, you know? Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, so that, that kind of upbringing where you're, you know, you, you, you got, you know, no, no real dad figure and you got a, you know, angry and absent mom figure. You know, I was out there just trying to fix people and, you know, looking for validation and looking for, you know, people to, you know, give me my self-worth rather than, than looking inside for it. So, so I grew, I grew up, you know, just completely off center with, with who I was and, 
you know, living an intentional life, just completely off center. And one day I just woke up one day and went, oh my God, like you've been doing it the total wrong way. Yeah. So then what about, um, like we were talking beforehand, you're headed off to England to visit a child. Um, so you, you since unfortunately have lost your sister and you mentioned a wife, you have kids. So how did, how did all that come out? How did it all work? So I had, um, so I accidentally, um, and when I say accidentally, I was not very smart. I, 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 just to put it bluntly, I married my mother, Mm -hmm. right? I just did. I I just, I didn't know it Mm -hmm. until one day I had a friend and, and, and my friend, I had been complaining to my friend for a couple of years over this relationship. My wife's so mean and she's so angry. She's this or that. And I knew I was like replaying something that I've been thinking about in my life since I was a kid about mean and angry and women and all this stuff. And he looked at me and he went, dude, you are the problem, not her. And I went, huh? What are you talking about? She's this and she's that. And he goes, yeah, but you have the power to change yourself and you're trying to change other people. You can't change other people. You got to, you got to worry about yourself. So why don't you fix yourself and stop worrying about everybody else? And I went, oh my God, that makes sense. So, um, at the time I had four-year-old twins and, um, I really wanted to be the opposite of what my parents were obviously without a partner, I, I couldn't, I, so I, so I was both mom and dad, uh, to my kids. They, they ended up living with me full time. Um, um, when they were uh, a little bit older than that. Um, but I really wanted to have them to have a safe space to know that they were loved, to be able to open dialogue with me about anything at any time and just live a safe, loving, you know, supportive environment, which is what I didn't have. And, and I was able to do that. I'm very close to my kids. Um, when they were teenagers, I uh, finally allowed myself to, um, uh, find, be open to a relationship with a strong, intelligent, you know, not, not messed up past woman, you know, like, like I, I'd, I'd always kind of, made sure that, um, anybody that had their act together was somebody I, I didn't belong with, mm-hmm. you know, cause I needed a mess that I could fix. So when I finally decided that that's the wrong approach to take, right. Which took a long time to really understand the depths of that. Um, then I met my wife We're we're married. She's, she's wonderful. She helped me, you know, with my kids during their teenage years and giving them extra guidance that, you know, I couldn't do cause I was too close to them. Um, and yeah, so my, my kids are definitely overachievers. One just uh, got their masters at Cambridge. The, her her twin brother just got his masters from university of Chicago. They're, uh, they're out there trying to make their way in the world. And I couldn't, couldn't be prouder of them. And it's so good to hear from like an early age where things weren't as great to now having a good relationship with your kids, being in a better marriage, and being able to, again, have that friend kind of telling you, look inside yourself um, and really, really figure out what's going on. Yeah. And I, you know, I, 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 I felt to my core, you know, people, you know, I felt like I was a really good dad. Like I felt like I was, I was really good about it. And people would say, oh my God, your kids are so good. You have such a good relationship with them. What's the key? And it's the same key that I found when I wrote this cycle of lives book when it came to being able to talk to people about really, really difficult, true experiences, you know, traumatic stuff, people talking about abuse, um, suicide of a parent, uh, drug addiction, and, you know, just abandonment, all these things. And it was um, that I I really wanted to provide them a truly authentic, safe space. And so oftentimes, I would pick them up from their moms. We would drive to my house and I put the car in park and I would say, okay, let's talk, you know, and they're six years old and they're like, I don't know what to talk about. And I said, well, let's just talk about everything. How was your week? You know? And they're like, oh, it's fine. I go, no, 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 no. Let's talk about it. Cause I knew what they were going through there. And they would talk about being yelled out for no reason. And they would talk about, you know, 
this and that and, and pretty traumatic stuff. And I would let him talk and let him get out. Oh, what do you think about that? And how does that make you feel? And whatever. And then I would say, look, when we get out of the car and come to the house, this is a safe home. Don't worry about how I'm going to act. Don't worry about anything. If, if you don't want to talk, it's good. If you do want to talk, it's good. Like, like let's, let's all, let's all be safe with each other. And so um, providing a safe space for people to know that you care or you want to learn how to care and you're doing it with intentionality and you're, you're doing it from a, a good place. Like you're not, you don't have the answers for them. You just want to maybe figure out how to ask the same questions as them or whatever, but just provide a safe space for people to figure out all of their crap and for, for you to be there for them, no matter what, it's a great, great place to start for building really deep relationships. Yeah. And I, it sounds like your kids ended up uh, with the best possibilities that they could have. And you really did help them to both now get master's degrees. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I and this come from a guy, I mean, I, I ran hundred million dollar businesses. I've, I've done a lot in my life, right? I've done a lot. I, and, but I never went to college. I went to college, but I, I dropped out very, very quickly because life got in the way, but I, I never got a college degree. And you know, um, my daughter was a division one golfer, honors college, the first Rhodes Scholar in, in her school's 95 year history, uh, Rhodes Scholar finalist. You know, my son was top of his class at UCSD in a really difficult area of philosophy. And they're super, super smart, but um, only because I've given them the confidence to just be who they are and figure it out. And, and I, and I always say to them, just like I say to myself now, dude, if you if you really feel passionate about something and want to do it, go after it and be the best or don't do it. And if you fail, it's OK. It, it really is OK. Yeah. Like, like, don't beat yourself up. If, 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 if all of a sudden you want to do something 180, fine, forgive yourself, move on. You, now you know you want to do something 180, go do that and do that the best. Right. And if you can't, then don't worry about it. Just just whatever. So um I try to be pretty supportive because I I feel like I never had that supportive thing. And I, and I really believe that's where it starts, you know, just, just knowing that you're there, you, they have a safe space with you. Um, no matter what happens with them, you're just there. You know, that's, that's an important thing. Yeah, it truly is. Now, before I start to wrap things up, is there anything else that you would like to share with the listeners about you, your personal story, any of the books you've written? Um, no, I mean, the only thing that I would share is this. I mean, um, I, I, I'm not like a preachy, do this, don't do that kind of person. Right. I, I'm, we all have lessons to learn and we can all learn from each other, but I, I will say that I, I know for sure out of this project, one, one thing that's happened that, uh, I feel a hundred percent confident in, in asking this question and the question I'm going to ask is you, Sarah, all, each one of your listeners, there's no doubt there's somebody, if you really think about it, there's somebody that's going through something really hard or recently did go through something hard. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know what? I, I've let life get in the way. I didn't want to step on their toes. I, you know, I didn't want to make them feel guilty. You know, I didn't want to say the wrong thing. I didn't want to invade their space or whatever. And now a couple of weeks have gone by or a couple of months have gone by. And that person used to be a friend, but man, I'm hiding from them because of this or that. And I could have been there when they were going through that hard time. And they're probably sitting there wondering what happened to Sarah? Why hasn't she called me? Or, you know, she knows I'm going through a tough time. Why doesn't she, why doesn't she just pick up the phone or send me a note or whatever? And so you know, I, I think the only thing that I can can say if 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 anybody listening says, yeah, I think I, I kind of know that person um, that I should be reaching out to, it's don't be afraid to say the wrong thing. Don't be afraid to show some some empathy. Don't be afraid to, you know, invade their personal space because it, the call that you give to them could be life changing for them. It could be like they just wanted to know that somebody cared. And it's so easy to avoid having tough conversations, especially as more time goes on, um, to then backtrack and 
and say, oh, geez, I know it's been a while since I called, but I just wanted to check on you. And those are hard things to do. And I would just say there's somebody out there that needs that. So um, I've learned from this project that no matter who, doctor, patient, loved one, nurse, caregiver, survivor, you name it, part of their story involves being abandoned by people that they love. Part of their story involves isolating themselves from people because they're afraid that if they ask for help or show vulnerability that they're going to be let down. Um, and so if we can all just maybe engage in one hard conversation, it's really going to, it's really going to help, help other people. Yes. The hard conversations are always the hardest to start, but then as you know, you've said can be very impactful. Yeah, they really can. Now, uh, at the end of every episode with all of my guests, I do ask a random question to kind of throw something different at you. Uh-oh, give it to me. So my question for you this day is, um, what material possession would you grab if you if your house was burning down? Oh, man, that's a tough one. Are you kidding me? Um, well, all my photos are on the, are on the cloud or whatever, so I don't think I'd have to grab photos. Um, I do mosaic tile work, so I think I'd probably race to see if I could save one of my mosaic works, but probably not because they're. Geez, I don't know what I would grab. Um. I usually leave a bunch of cash laying around hiding somewhere in case I need it. I might go, I might go grab my cash, but I don't know if that's material possession as much as it's just like, I might need the cash because everything's burned down. <laughs> oh my goodness. What the hell? Um, I don't even know. I, I'm not sure I know how to answer that. I think I maybe kind of answered it, but I don't know. Material possession. I, nothing sticks out to me. My phone so I could call people and say, send, send help. <laughs> All right, that brings this episode to a close. I will, of course, be leaving a link to David's book, Cycle of Lives, uh, to the Amazon listing in this description. So feel free to go check the book out and, you know, read more about the stories that he has in that book. And of course, if you would like to connect with the podcast, all of our information is in the description as well. The website brings you to all of our social media, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. So feel free to go and follow those pages. And if you'd like to support the podcast monetarily or even be a guest on the podcast, my email is in the description along with the link for donating. Um, so I'd love for you to check all of those out. I love connecting with new people. So thank you so much, David, for spending time with me today and to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next time. Bye. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you.